Hello, hi everyone. Welcome back to Wu Can Cook. My name is Wesley, and this is a show where we are slowly cooking our way through all of the food from my childhood. Today, once again, as you might notice, we are not in the kitchen, but here in my studio, as we are once again adding to our series dedicated to the fundamentals of wok cooking. More specifically, we'll be getting to a topic that a lot of folks have been asking for, which is a hopefully brief guide to wok cooking on a home range and how and why it is so different from cooking in a normal frying pan. For those following along, a few months back, we also did a quick guide to pantry essentials, which seemed to be really helpful for folks building out their pantry for the first time. But I also know that we fully glossed over pretty much everything related to the actual cooking process because that video was already 17 minutes long. So in this video today, we're finally going to touch on some of the most asked questions that have come up over the years, such as how do I choose a good wok? How do I season it properly? How do I cook in it properly? And finally, most importantly, why are all of my stir fries turning out mushy? I'll start out by mentioning that the answer to a lot of these kinds of questions is really going to be related more broadly to good cooking fundamentals in general. That said though, I do also think that there are a number of wok specific techniques that are pretty unique to Asian cooking and at least to me, stand out quite a bit from Eurocentric cooking, especially with regards to high heat cooking, stir frying, and just generally how to cook in a giant frying pan that's shaped like a big ass bowl with a handle. Finally, as always with this series, I will once again make the disclaimer that I am by no means a culinary master, but I have done a lot of wok cooking and have also spent an entire lifetime watching my parents and grandparents do it as well. As always, the best that I can offer is what I know from personal experience and how I have come to approach wok cooking. While a lot of the things that we're going to touch on today are pretty broadly accepted techniques in wok cooking, many of these points are also a little bit more colloquial and simply come from my personal experiences gathered from a lifetime of cooking in a giant metal bowl. Okay, so let's get into it. All right, so kicking things off here first, we're going to start off with the age old question of what kind of wok should I buy to which the answer is it depends, but please don't buy a Teflon nonstick wok. Those things are awful. The goal with pretty much any wok cook, unless you're doing something really weird like making a Chinese lap chung carbonara, is to cook as much of your dish as possible on the highest possible heat. So to this end, metals like carbon steel, stainless steel, or cast iron are all really great conductors for wok cooking. Each have their own advantages and disadvantages, so you'll want to choose your wok based on what you plan on cooking and what kind of stove that you're cooking on. Carbon steel and stainless steel are both really great for cooking on a home gas range. Both respond to changes in temperature really quickly, which is not only useful for flash cooking, but also really great for deep frying and slow braising as well, because you can change the temperature of your fryer or braise on a dime. This is also why many wok cooks will tell you that their most versatile pan in the kitchen is the wok. You can just as easily stir fry in it as you can slow cook, braise, deep fry, shallow fry, and you can even make a pasta carbonara in one. Back to our metals though, stainless steel woks may require some extra elbow grease to clean over time, but as the name implies, it will pretty much last a lifetime. Carbon steel, in my experience, is a little bit easier to clean, but it does have a more lengthy break-in period as its patina develops, which means that the first few cooks on it will be a little bit uncomfortable. As the patina develops over time though, that carbon steel will eventually develop its own natural non-stick coating. There are many theories on how to properly season a carbon steel wok. Take a peek at the carbon steel subreddit and you'll see words like bluing and oxidation thrown around a lot. In my experience though, the best way to season a carbon steel wok is to simply just start cooking on it. Rendering bacon fat has been pretty effective for me, but to be honest, really just start using the thing. After five or six meals or so, the wok will start developing its own patina and color, which in turn becomes its very own natural non-stick coating. Now, Teflon woks, on the other hand, are coated with a non-stick Teflon coating to artificially replicate this natural non-stick coating. And while this is very useful to keep eggs from sticking to the surface, the problem with Teflon is that it also prevents the pan from reaching the extreme high heats that you need for wok cooking. This means that no matter how hot that your stove range gets, the wok will never get hot enough to properly stir fry, and you'll end up cooking on medium to medium high heat most of the time. 
Now, you could potentially work around this by doing a lot of batch cooking for your stir fries. More on this in a moment. But most likely what's gonna happen is that your wok will end up underheated and you'll be eating a very porridgey stir fry for dinner. So why do Teflon woks even exist then? I don't know. But sadly, they are also the main type of wok that you'll see in most retail stores. So beware of Teflon woks when you do your shopping. Next up, we're finally getting to the question that a lot of people keep asking me, which is what kind of wok is that and where can I get one for myself? The wok that I cook in is a 16 inch round bottomed carbon steel wok. It does not have a brand name on it because I got it at a restaurant supply store. But if you're looking for one here in the Bay Area, I got mine at Chenko in downtown Oakland for something like 15 bucks. I personally find that the rounded bottom helps the wok to be a little bit more agile in stir frying and tossing, with the downside being that on more than one occasion, it has also rolled off of the stove, which is not ever fun. If you can navigate this though, the shape of a rounded bottom wok will also allow for the oil to gather at its center, which makes it very useful for shallow frying as well. And if you've never shallow fried an egg in a rounded bottom wok, you're missing out on one of the greatest experiences in life. For those who are new to wok cooking though, I also always recommend a flat bottomed wok, which will feel a little bit more similar to a standard frying pan, but with the high walls and shape of a wok for stir frying and tossing. My wok, like many other carbon steel woks, is literally just a sheet of carbon steel that has been shaped into a wok shape, which means that it does not have any heavy bottom to it. This helps keep the wok fairly light and agile when tossing. I think mine clocks in somewhere under five pounds, I believe. The downside, however, is that the heavy bottom of a standard frying pan is designed in this way to retain heat for the pan as the pan starts to fill up. Since a wok does not have a heavy bottom to it, heat retention is a constant factor that we have to be mindful of. This means, in other words, that as the wok starts to fill up with stuff, it will become more and more difficult for it to maintain its temperature on a standard home range. In wok cooking, we solve this issue by either cooking over extremely high BTU output wok burners, which we'll touch on in a moment, or in home cooking, we work around this with a technique called batch cooking, where we cook a certain portion of the stir fry, then remove, reheat, and repeat with the next portion of food. This is a really useful technique with stir fries that have a lot of ingredients in them because it allows us to cook each individual ingredient on really high heat, even with a standard 25,000 BTU home range. The downside to batch cooking is that as you remove ingredients and restart, you'll also be adding more and more oil to the wok with each batch. So when we're batch cooking, we simply also want to be mindful of how much oil we add on each batch, otherwise we'll end up with an excessively oily stir fry. A common opinion that I see thrown around quite a bit is that you can't cook in a wok on an induction or electric top range, which is not necessarily true, you just need to cook slightly differently. In my experience, the biggest obstacle that I have run into with these types of ranges is that they maintain their heat setting by heating the coils up to a certain temperature, then switch off briefly and then switch back on to make sure that the coils don't overheat past their heat setting. With a heavy bottomed frying pan, this won't cause too much of an issue because the heavy bottom of that frying pan will retain heat during that brief off period so that your cook process isn't disrupted. With a wok, however, since it does not have a heavy bottom, this brief off period is going to be a pretty big problem because the wok is going to cool down significantly while the coils are turned off. I have seen some folks suggest that you can work around this by simply cooking in even smaller batches with your batch cook, which certainly makes sense, but I imagine is also going to be pretty annoying since you'll have to reset your wok after pretty much every single ingredient. In my experience, the best solution that I have come across with electric and induction top wok cooking is a good old fashioned cast iron wok. Just like a cast iron pan, a cast iron wok will retain heat for freaking days, which will absolutely negate those brief off period with your coils. Okay, maybe not for entire days, but cast iron does have really great heat retention properties though, even without a dedicated heavy bottom. The only downside to a cast iron wok is that it will be really, really heavy. Mine weighed something around 30 pounds or so. So at this weight, you're probably not going to do very much wok tossing with your stir fries, but just work in a bit more spatula and tong work and you're gonna be just fine. 
Finally, rounding out our discussion on woks and wok cooking, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about cooking in an actual wok burner. Those that have been to the Wu Can Cook pop-up have seen us cooking on these beastly looking wok burners made by Wokman LLC. More on these folks in the description for those who are interested. Wok burners have a much higher heat output than your more standard home gas ranges, relatively comparable to the heat output that you would find on a commercial gas range, although I believe that these Wokman burners even outpace most commercial gas ranges too. But contrary to popular belief, I actually don't think that the key to a good wok burner is just about BTU output, because heat distribution is equally if not more important. The real advantage of cooking on a wok burner versus cooking on a home gas range comes from its ability to evenly heat the entire wok no matter how full it is, which is very difficult to achieve in larger woks when there's a lot of surface area to heat. Most wok burners will have extremely directional heat, like this unnamed wok burner that I have here. While with this wok burner, the wok will get very, very hot, it won't proportionally heat the entire wok, but instead pretty much just the center of the wok. To solve this, I personally prefer these jet burner style wok burners because they more evenly distribute heat around the wok for a consistent high heat cook. Last up, rounding out our wok cooking basics video today, I thought I'd finally get to a request that a lot of folks have been asking for, which is an actual meal cooked on a wok burner. Full disclosure, I've been afraid to do this for a while now because wok burners are very dangerous and I live in a very tiny apartment with a very tiny alleyway backyard. But this felt like a good time to dive into wok burner cooking technique and I also wanted to do something cool for our 101st video, so here we go. Today we're going to cook through our Panda Express Kung Pao Chicken recipe, not only because it is delicious, but also because Kung Pao Chicken has a lot of ingredients in it, which makes it a great example for wok cooking technique since the wok is going to get pretty full. For our purposes today, I'm going to skip over our prep work for brevity, but I'll also link the original recipe video that we did for this here. I have my wok burner at about 60% heat here. Every burner is going to be a little bit different and we're also going to adjust this as the wok starts to fill up. But what I tell the chefs in our pop-up is that we want to be able to hear the flames coming out, literally like the sound of a jet engine burner, like so. As always, we're starting off with our long yao, but you'll notice that I'm doing this with a quarter cup of oil to start, then removing and repeating. This is going to help seal off the porous metal of our carbon steel for our non-stick coating. On home burner wok cooking, I often skip this step because it's a waste of oil and I find that I can get away without it, but at these super high heats, it is actually very important and you won't be able to get a non-stick surface without this step. Now, in our original recipe video, we did this dish in four separate batches to navigate heat retention, but today this is all going to happen in one single cook, so as always, mise en place is going to be very important. I'm starting off with my chicken thigh going into the wok first, which I'm letting sear for just one minute before tossing. I like to bring down the heat of the burner by about 10% or so for sears as well, otherwise the proteins start to burn before they can properly sear. Then next, I'm shifting the chicken to one side so that we may add in our aromatic garlic, ginger, and the whites of my green onions, which I'm blooming until nice and fragrant for about 10 seconds. Then I'm giving this all a toss to combine and then immediately following this up with my bell pepper and zucchini. These are gonna get a short 30 second head start before I add in my onions and peanuts next, which we're also sauteing for another minute until just past their raw stage. Next, I'm adding in my sauce mixture plus a quarter cup of water and then tossing to combine for another 30 seconds. Then finally, last up, we're adding in our cornstarch slurry to thicken that sauce up, giving one more quick toss and we're ready to eat. All right, so as you can see here, the results of our wok burner Kung Pao chicken versus our home range Kung Pao chicken are relatively similar with the primary difference being that the wok burner cook was a lot faster. Since we didn't have to constantly stop and reheat the wok in between each ingredient, this allowed our cook process to flow a lot more seamlessly. For reference, this wok burner Kung Pao chicken took about four minutes altogether, whereas our home range Kung Pao chicken took closer to 20 minutes. Otherwise though, the results are fairly similar since both cooks happened on similarly high heat. Both stir fries have a smoky quality to it from its open flame cook, and both have a crispy flash cooked veggie done on extremely high heat. 
If anything, I'd say that the wok burner cook is a tad less oily than the home range cook, since we weren't periodically adding oil with each batch cook like we did with the home range version. But I also think that this is manageable if you keep conscious about how much oil that you add on each batch. Okay, so that's it everyone. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it was helpful and informative or at the very least entertaining to watch. For those who are new to the channel, this one is part of a larger wok cooking basics series dedicated to the fundamentals of wok cooking. So check out that series next if you haven't yet as well. As always with these basics videos, I know that there are a lot of things that we didn't get to today. So if there was something that I left out that you wanted me to talk about, feel free to drop that in the comments and we'll touch on it in the next video. For the Bay Area locals, the Wu Can Cook Fried Rice pop-up is back at Oakland first Friday next month. So swing by and come say hi if you can. More about that at wucancook.com slash eats. As always, like, comment, subscribe, share, be nice internetters, and I'll see you soon. Bye.